welcome to class tonight. Uh, it's good to see you all here. Um, I will warn you in advance, my voice has been out the last two mornings, and it's been a conscious effort for me to keep my voice. And so at times throughout this class, you'll hear my voice do very weird, very high-pitched squealies. It's not on purpose. I just have very little control of my voice at the moment. Uh, but nonetheless, we're here, and we're going to uh, keep on going in class. We are, uh, and we have been looking at uh, finding safety. Uh, Proverbs chapter 18 and verse 10, uh, which says, The name of the Lord is a strong power. The righteous runs to it and is safe. We have been studying that, uh, we have discovered that the names of God reveal God's character. We learn his names, we learn of who he is, of what he's done, of what he will do. And as we know that, we find out that we are safe in him. Uh, we have gained safety, not just in our salvation, but in our day-to-day -day lives. Uh, when the uh, trials and temptations of this life surround us, uh, we run to him, and we can find our safety and our security in him. The name of the Lord is a strong tower, it is safety. The righteous runs to it and is safe. Uh, we have been discovering that if we will but seek him, we will find safety and we will find security. Uh, there are uh, three primary names of God that we've looked at uh, in this series of lessons. Uh, there is Jehovah that we've been studying the last uh, several weeks. Uh, the, what were the other two, though? El and Adonai. El and Adonai. Very good. Uh, El meaning uh, the mighty one of God. Adonai means Lord or Master. Uh, those are the primary names. And the purpose of the study is, is that many times uh, the Hebrews would have fixed uh, adjectives or nouns to the end of that name and give a character. Uh, Jehovah uh, and Jireh and the Lord. And we, when you see those characteristics and those attributes described, he is not just Jehovah, he's Jehovah and Jireh. Uh, these names uh, describe the character of God. And that's what we have been uh, studying, we've been looking into. Uh, for the first part of this lesson tonight, we are going to do a little bit of review. Uh, we're winding down in these lessons. Actually, this is the next to last lesson uh, in this particular series uh, before we move on to a different series. And so uh, we're going to take a few minutes to uh, to review and make sure you remember what all these names are uh, because this will be crucial to the latter part of the lesson. And uh, these are the various names that we have studied the last few weeks. Under Jehovah, we have discussed uh, Jehovah Jireh, Jehovah Nissi, Jehovah uh, Machinechashim, Jehovah Sidkenu, Jehovah Sabaoth, and Jehovah Shalom, and Jehovah Shema, Jehovah Rapha, Jehovah Rahai, and Jehovah Nakal. This is what those names mean. They are, however, out of order. And that is uh, done for a purpose. Because uh, I'm going to quiz you for a brief moment and see if you can help me to sort out uh, these meanings with their names. Some of them you probably remember, some of them you probably don't. Uh, but we will uh, work through it together. Jehovah Jireh. What does that mean? G. <laughs> That's correct. The Lord will provide. Yeah. Uh, Jehovah Jireh meant that the Lord will provide. Remember that lesson we looked at uh, Abraham offering Isaac uh, there at Mount Moriah? And we talked about how that God provided uh, a beautiful picture there of salvation, how that God provided the only begotten Son for the salvation of mankind. He is Jehovah Jireh. He provides salvation. And if he can meet that need, he can meet all other needs as well. And then the next one uh, we covered uh, was Jehovah Messiah. Uh, which means what? Anybody remember? Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, that is correct. It means it was K. Okay. Uh, the Lord is my banner. And we discussed that battle uh, where yeah, Moses was fighting the Amalekites. And he uh, held that banner up high. And when they, the banner was up in the air, the Israelites won the battle. But if he ever dropped it down, uh, we lost. Uh, the Israelites would lose the battle. And so we talked about how the Lord is our banner, and we raise it up, and we fight for Him. The victory is assured. And so uh, that was out of the book of Exodus. Uh, then the next two uh, was the two uh, 
names that don't sound uh, very Englishy in their pronunciations. Uh, Jehovah Machendekersen, uh, which was H. It was H, the Lord who sanctifies. Okay, Mr. Robbie, I'm going to uh, <laughs> Under that name, we looked at how that uh, God is our sanctifier. God is the one who sets us apart. He sets us apart in position at salvation. At salvation, when we repent of our sin and place our faith in Christ, uh, our position changes. We're no longer sinners, alienated, separated from God. We are His children. We have been adopted. And we have been set apart. And then there is also um, a practical sanctification. How uh, we now live our lives uh, being set apart from sin and apart to God. And we talked about and how that eventually there would be a permanent sanctification. How one day Jesus is going to sin, he's going to take us home to be with him. He'll permanently set us apart from the presence of sin at that time. Mm -hmm. Hand in hand with that one was Jehovah Sidkenu, uh, which we covered next, uh, which meant... Anybody? And if you can't see the code, you can feel free just to just start off as being and I'll match it up for you. Jehovah Sidkenu was the Lord our righteousness, which is number Letter. 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 It is day. Uh, Lord, our righteousness. Uh, he is uh, how we are right. Uh, uh, righteous simply is a uh, state of being right, being as you should be. We are not. Uh, we are sinners. Uh, we have fallen from God's grace. We've fallen short of the glory of God by our sin. Uh, but yet, we receive the righteousness of Christ at salvation. It is put upon our account. Uh, that's why Paul said, in Philippians 3, uh, that being found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is according to the law, but the righteousness of God, which is by the faith of Christ, upon all that believe. Uh, that uh, says it all. I don't want to be found at the judgment day, standing before Christ, saying, look at my righteousness, look at all the good things I've done. I want to stand there saying, I have nothing but your righteousness. And so we talked about that the Lord is righteous, and he gives us his righteousness and salvation. And then we are to mirror and to reflect that righteous lifestyle in the way that we live our lives. Uh, moving on down, Jehovah uh, Sabaoth, which meant that the Lord is a post. So very good. I keep reading when I put my mark. Uh, the Lord of hosts, which is A. Very good. He is the God of the angel armies, as the song says. He commands the captain of the Lord's armies. We know that a God before us, uh, who can truly be against us. And then we talk about Jehovah Shalom, which is the Lord of Peace. Uh, very good. Peace which is E. Shalom Ek. Shalom Ek. Peace out. E. Uh, the Lord is our peace. We can't know peace in our lives. We can't know peace at all if we don't know Jesus Christ. Christ is peace. Uh, and then we looked at Jehovah Shema, uh, which was the Lord is present. I'm very good. Uh, which <laughs> the Lord is present. We talked about the fact that God is present in our day-to-day -day lives. Uh, he will never leave us nor forsake us. He's always there for us. Friends and family may forsake us, but God never will. He's always there for us. Uh, Jehovah Rapha, which which is see, I uh, the Lord our healer. healer. God heals us uh, spiritually as well as physically. Uh, the number one uh, healing that we need is healing from sin. Uh, sin brought about death. It brought about separation from God. But yet, God provided the uh, needed atonement, the needed medicine for that remedy by the death of His Son upon Calvary. And the blood of Jesus Christ pays for and covers all of our sin. Next was Jehovah Roah. This is the Psalm 23 name. Shepherd. shepherd. Very good. Lord is our shepherd. And then uh, the last thing we talked about the relationship we have with God, how he shepherds us. He leads us, and provides for us. He takes care of us as well. And then finally we talked about last week we covered Jehovah Nakah, which which is 
a lord of a recompense, which is number <laughs> D. And we talked about how that God uh, chastens and he judges us as his children. Uh, we are forever and always his child, uh, but sometimes we err. Sometimes we choose to go back and to live for the world, but even those times he still <laughs> treats us, the Father treats his children. He tries to bring us back to him. Now, when we've gone through these lessons, every time that we've come to the to the end of one of the major names of God, the main names of God, those El, Adonai, or Jehovah, we've always taken the time to go and to compare these names to Jesus. We know that Jesus is God. Very simple statement, John chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. That says it all. The Word, according to verse 14, of that same chapter was made flesh and dwelt among us. He beheld his glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And Jesus is God. He possesses all the characteristics, all the attributes that God does. And so the simple fact of the matter is that since he is God, he has all those attributes, all those characteristics. Then we should be able to find these situations and the verses that attribute these things to Jesus. Tonight, we are going to be discussing uh, Jesus' deity in light of these names of God. And we apply all of these to Christ using various uh, scriptures. Uh, if you have your Bibles, uh, you can turn to the Gospel according to John. John's Gospel was written for the intent and purpose of showing that Jesus is God. Uh, all four of the Gospels are thematic. They're each written to prove a different point, to show and to highlight uh, a different uh, characteristic of Christ, a different uh, side of Christ's life. Matthew wrote to show that Jesus was the king. He's the rightful heir. He's the king. He is sovereign. Um, uh, Luke wrote to show he's the perfect man, Mark, the perfect servant. Yet John's Gospel is written to prove and to show that Jesus was God. It opens up with that addressment. And in the end, it concludes that way as well. And John shows that he is deity in his gospel. Uh, this uh, gospel, it, and that's what I love about the gospel of John, is that almost every chapter has some reference and discussion about the deity of Christ. Uh, especially in uh, the, the sixth and the eighth chapters, you will find where Jesus actually goes into great detail and he defends his deity to the Pharisees. Uh, they say, well, you say you're God, well, prove it to me. And he does. And he goes and gives those qualities. I find it very fascinating uh, to see how Jesus proved his deity to those who questioned him. And at times he simply said, well, you've seen the Father, you've seen me. Well, one of the key things in John is you find these I am statements. Uh, the name Jehovah, which I actually skipped that one uh, when we were calling out answers, uh, is uh, the self-existent one, the I am that I am. Uh, Jehovah could at times be shortened down to simply uh, Yah. could be simply the uh, condensed version. When Jesus would say the statement that I am, as we're going to see in these uh, verses we're about to look at, uh, he would be uh, referencing and he would be claiming to be God. Uh, when he said the I am, uh, the Pharisees knew it, the Jews knew that he was uh, asserting himself to share the characteristics of Jehovah. <laughs> they had no doubt. We're going to see several instances where when he did that, that the Jews would pick up stones and they would try to kill him uh, because they recognized and they knew the fact that, hey, this man just said he was God. And that's blasphemy. Of course, we know it wasn't blasphemy because he actually was God. And it's not a lie to say you're God if you are God. Uh, but if you're not, it's blasphemy and it is uh, wrong. The very first I am statement that we're going to look at is going to be in John chapter 6. John chapter 6, beginning in verse number 35. In John chapter 6 and verse 35, Jesus has just, uh, he spent the multitude, he's crossed over the sea, <laughs> and the multitudes have fallen. Uh, this is a, an interesting story to me. Uh, he says, you didn't follow me because you saw the signs or the miracles, you followed me because I fed you. Uh, these people weren't following Christ across the river to see his miracles or to know he was Messiah. They were following him because he met their uh, their physical needs of hunger and they enjoyed just the food. They weren't following him for the right reasons. 
And so he took this example and he, he built on it and he showed uh, and he taught them using their demand and their need for food. Uh, he says in verse 30, uh, I'm sorry, in verse 34, uh, well, he's talked about the manna and uh, to understand this verse, you understand, and the Pharisees and the Jews were saying that, well, you, well, you know what, I'm going to give you Let's just start reading. Verse 29. Jesus answered and said unto them, This is the work of God, to believe on him whom he has sent. They said therefore unto him, What sign showest you then, that we may see and believe thee? What dost thou work? Basically what they're saying is, Okay, you claim to be God, give me a miracle. Show me a sign that you are God. Keep in mind, he just fed a multitude of 5,000 people. <laughs> if they want a sign. He says, Our fathers did eat manna in the desert, as it is written, He gave them bread from heaven to eat. Verily, verily, I say unto you, Moses gave you not that bread from heaven, but my Father giveth you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he which came down from heaven and giveth life unto the world. The Jews are saying, hey, when Moses led us in the wilderness, he, he got us manna from heaven. He gave us that manna from heaven and it showed he was from God. What kind of sign are you going to give unto us? Uh, Jesus says, well, first misconception. That bread didn't come from Moses. He came from God. It's the bread from heaven. And he went on to say that he himself actually was the bread from heaven. He says, The bread of God is he which came down from heaven and gives life unto the world. And they said unto him, Lord, evermore give us this bread. In other words, from this day forward, give us this bread. We want this bread. And he said unto them, I am the bread of life. He that comes to me shall never hunger, and he that believeth on me shall never thirst. For I said unto you that you also have seen me, and believe not. All that the Father giveth me shall come to me, and him that cometh to me I will in no wise cast out. For I came down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him that sent me. And this is the Father's will which hath sent me, that of all which he has given me, I should lose nothing. I should raise it up again at the last day. And this is the will of him that sent me, that every one that seeth the Son and believes on him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up at the last day. Uh, there is a sequence of events here, but primarily key on the fact that Jesus says in verse uh, number 35 that he is the bread of life. Uh, he is the true bread uh, that came down from heaven and died upon the cross to meet our needs. Uh, when we uh, partake of him, we believe and trust in him for salvation, uh, he satisfies our spiritual needs. Uh, not physical uh, uh, substance and the need for physical food, but spiritual. Uh, Jesus Christ is the all-sufficient means of life. Uh, when we partake of him as the bread of life, he satisfies that need and we receive eternal life. Now I said there is a sequence here and uh, you need to understand these verses build on each other. He says that uh, in verses 36 and 37 he talks about how that everyone the Father gives unto him he's not going to cast out. Uh, there is a great statement of eternal security there because everyone that he received and the Father gives to Jesus will never be cast out. Uh, they're never going to be forsaken enough to play with. But that's not Calvinistic in saying that God's only going to select some, because if you read down to the next verse, Jesus explains who the Father gives. Because he says, that the Father's will which has sent me, that all who have given me, I shall do nothing. But in verse 4 he says, this is the will of him that sent me, that everyone which sees the Son believes on him may have everlasting life. And I'll raise him up at the last and day. All those that believe and trust in Christ for salvation, they uh, receive eternal life. He's the bread of life. He is uh, that which provides and meets that need for life. When we trust in him for salvation, we receive eternal life. And the Father gives us unto Christ, and he will, then we will never be uh, cast out. And that's the basic flow of these verses. God gives to, the Father gives to the Son, all those who believe and trust in him, they're never going to be cast out. He is the bread of life. He satisfies the spiritual uh, hunger and thirst for salvation and for the payment of sins. Uh, seeing that he is the bread of life and that he uh, satisfies our spiritual needs, uh, which one of these would you say qualifies as that? G. I. I think you're thinking G, Bobby. Uh, I heard G, the Lord will provide. Uh, that is... He satisfies our, our need. He provides. Uh, oh, I covers all of it. Yeah. Uh, I heard I, I as well. Um, uh, that is good. Uh, it does provide us. 
God does indeed provide for it and it meets now. our <laughs> needs. But also in his words, you can also see um, a good bit of Jehovah uh, Sid Canoe as well. He is our righteousness. You see eternal life, receive the righteousness of God as well. Uh, he's righteous. He meets that need. And we see that in that bread of life, guess what? It's a righteous bread. It's good bread. And it will make us righteous in the sight of God as well. I could go on with that for quite a while, but we are pressed for time. And so, <laughs> and not just is he the bread of life, but in John chapter 8, uh, just flip, flip forward a little bit. We're going to make a quick tour of the Gospel of John tonight. Uh, in John chapter 8 and verse number 12, Jesus says, uh, He says, Then spake Jesus again to them, saying, uh, This is John chapter 8 and verse 12. He says, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me will not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. Um, to, to understand this statement about Christ being uh, the light of the world, you need to understand a little bit about the context of his saying. Uh, they have just finished what the Jews call the Feast of the Tabernacles. Uh, they've gone to the seven-day feast. If you back up to the previous chapter, uh, Jesus has been there. He's been discussing at this feast. He's gone. He's talked to the Pharisees. There's been an incident with the uh, adulterous woman. Uh, and so this feast is over. Uh, to understand this, I'm going to do something I don't usually do in class, and I'm going to read to you a little bit for a moment uh, about the background, because uh, he summarizes it very well. And so I'm going to read this uh, very briefly. Uh, the background of this statement. Uh, Jesus had entered the temple on the octave, which was the special Sabbath, uh, the following day after the Feast of Tabernacles. Now, the Feast of Tabernacles celebrated God's provision during the 40-year wilderness wandering. Remember, Israel was were called out of Egypt and then they wandered in the wilderness for 40 years before they entered the Promised Land. Okay. The, uh, the Feast of Michael celebrated God's provision during that 40 year period. It, the provision of water from the rock uh, and the provision of supernatural light through the manifest presence of God in the fiery pillar and the Shekinah glory of God of the people and in the tabernacle as well. Now, the supernatural light, the Shekinah glory, was commemorating the lighting of the four giant golden. Uh, candelabras or lampstands which stood in the court of the women and towered 15 feet above the temple grounds on the temple mount. Uh, these enormous and ornately decorated representations of the fiery pillar and the brilliant Shekinah glory of God in the tabernacle were lit each evening of the seven day feast. Once lit, these lampstands brightly illuminated the entire temple and could be seen from any point in Jerusalem. Uh, special windows magnified the effect being designed to allow maximum light to shine out of the temple, uh, all symbolic of the Shekinah dwelling in the temple. Uh, the first light bulb, uh, the light is shining in the temple, and it was magnified and lit up the entire city, uh, so to speak, during this uh, feast. But each day after the morning sacrifice and ceremonies, the festive meal, uh, the entire afternoon spent meditation on the wall and the evening sacrifice. Uh, just as darkness fell, a special ceremony the lighting of the candelabra was held. As hundreds of thousands of worshippers watched, priests ascended the four ladders or to the four golden bowls uh, filled with ten gallons of oil each and lit the oil-soaked wicks comprised of used priestly garments. As the sky began to glow, uh, they began to, to praise in a, a little worship service in the front of those, and then the choir would sing uh, the 15-degree ascent songs as they ascended up the 15 steps which led to the core of the women and to the, well, from the core of the women to the core of the men. And all of this not only looked back to Shekinah in the past, but also ahead to the future Shekinah presence of God when the Messiah comes in the kingdom. Uh, after just amazing stands upon the outpouring of water that previous morning, uh, this ceremony had been held for its final time this particular year. And the lights have been now been extinguished as the symbols go out, reality sets in. The Shekinah is not in the temple, it has not been since its departure uh, before the Babylonian captivity as it's recorded in Ezekiel. That's a lot of history and a lot of details. Why is that important? Because as they are extinguishing uh, those candelabras as the feast is over, and Jesus stands there in that midst, undoubtedly beside and pointing towards and looking at uh, those candelabras, he gave the very pointed statement, I am the light of the world. Those candelabras were symbolic and they stood for the symbolic for the very kind of glory of God. 
when Jesus made the statement that I am the light of the world, he made a direct statement, a direct accusation that he was the Shekinah glory of God. He said, I am that light of the world. Uh, that pillar that follows you by day and by night, I was in uh, I am that Jehovah Jireh. I am uh, the light of the world. This is uh, a very direct statement by Christ. The Jews would have had no doubt. He just said he was God. He was the light of the world. He brought uh, illumination and revelation to men of their sin and their need for the Savior. He was that light of the world. And all those who dwelt and who, who trusted in him and followed him, just the same way as the kind of glory and provided guidance and provided for and took care of them during that time that led them to the wilderness, protected them, so too God and Jesus Christ as the light of the world leads and protects those who follow after him in this life. Jesus is the light of the world. He is Jehovah God. He is the provider and the protector of us. Of those who believe and trust in him, he is that light. He protects them and he leads them here in this life. And this speaks of, uh, again, of the Lord being our righteousness, but it also speaks of God being our provider. Uh, Jehovah Jireh, or even Jehovah Roi, the shepherd. The one who went before, prepared the way for the sheep, the same way he's the light of the world. He prepares and he leads us and he guides us here in this life. But he's also the Lord who is present. And Jehovah Shema. The Lord is present with them during the wilderness, and the Lord is present with us today in our life. We will lead in if we have trusted in him for salvation. Uh, Jesus is uh, the bread of life. He is the light of the world. He is God. Uh, he shares all these attributes that God does. And we can see this uh, displayed in his names. The next two. Still in chapter 8. Skip down and read uh, verse number 24. Jesus said in verse 24 of chapter 8, He said, I said therefore unto you that you shall die in your sins. Now literally that word sins is in the singular and it's not plural. So he's talking about the sin of unbelief, I believe, in particular here. He says, For if you believe not that I am, now note that the word he in this verse is in italics. Uh, that means it's not in the original. King James added it for uh, clarity and translation. Uh, literally, all that Jesus said here is, For if you believe not that I am, you will die in your sins. If you believe not that I am, I believe that this is the very plain as day statement by Jesus that I am Jehovah. Because I am, he's even calling in the whole uh, divine name when he said that. I am. If you don't believe that I am, you're going to die in your sin of unbelief. Uh, and that's the very simple statement of Christ. Jesus is God. He is Jehovah. When he died upon that cross of Calvary, when he shed his blood there, he provided and he met the need of our salvation. And if we believe and trust in Jehovah God, as when Jireh has provided our salvation, he will save us. Uh, this verse is very plain. Say to me that Jesus says, I am. I am God. I am Jehovah. Believe in me. Trust in me. I am God. Skipping down again in this chapter, and uh, I've Trying to go quick here, so I get time to cover all the stuff I have up here on the board. But uh, verse 58. This is one of my favorite statements of Christ defending his deity in this entire chapter. He, he said in verse 56, he said, Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it, and he was glad. <laughs> then said the Jews unto him, Thou art not yet fifty years old. And have you seen Abraham? And Jesus said, Abraham, he rejoiced to see and to know my day. Pharisee looked at, you're not even 50 years old. He was, Jesus was probably between 30 and 33 years old. And he said, you're not even 50 years old. How could you have ever seen Abraham? And Jesus said unto them, verily, verily, means truly, truly, before Abraham was, I am. I like that verse because Jesus did not say before Abraham was, I was. He did not say that. He said before Abraham was, I am. And God has always been. 
that Jesus Christ is self-existent. Uh, Jehovah Shema and Jehovah both talk about how the fact that God is self-existent. Uh, he is over time. That Jesus was before Abraham. He will be. He was during Abraham. He was after Abraham. God existed before you were born. He exists during your life. And he'll exist after you leave uh, this part and this trek of life down here. God's always been and he always will be. Uh, he is self-existent and he will forever remain that way. And Jesus is that God. He is self-existent. He always has been. He always will be. Uh, he is the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. That's very succinct. He was before Abraham. He still is before Abraham. He is the self-existent one. He is Jehovah. He is uh, the God of Abraham. Continuing on down the I Am statements, Christ claiming to be deity, you know, there's different uh, earmarks to that. In John chapter 10. Uh, this one should be an easy one for y'all to uh, to pick out which uh, attribute uh, is to be described here. In John chapter 10, uh, beginning in verse 7. Then said Jesus unto them, to them again, uh, Verily, verily, I say, Where are you going? I say unto you, I am the door of the sheep. All that ever came before me are thieves and robbers. But the sheep did not hear them. I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he will be saved. They shall go in and out and find pasture. The thief come not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. We'll stop right there. Two things. Jesus said he was the door, and he said he was the good shepherd. There is only one door into and out of that sheepfold, and Jesus was that door. There is only one way to be with the Father. We'll get to the uh, later on, John chapter 14, we'll get there momentarily. Jesus said, I am the way. The only way to be with God and to be in a relationship with God is through Jesus Christ. You can't get there any other way. God provided only one means, and that was His Son, Jehovah, the door to bring with the Father. And it just so happens that that door gets you there, Jehovah, He's also the Good Shepherd as well. In verse 11, He says, I am the Good Shepherd. Uh, that 23rd Psalm that we read, we talked about how the God is our Shepherd, He leads us, provides, or takes care of us. That is just a description. Jesus Christ. He provides us salvation. He provides us guidance and direction uh, here in this life. God, Jesus Christ, is the good shepherd. I love that. Because then just say Jesus is the shepherd. He said he's the good shepherd. Uh, Jesus is the good shepherd. He's the best shepherd. Uh, he is Jehovah God. He uh, can know in advance all that's going to transpire. He's ever there to protect and to watch out for us here in this life. He is the bread of life. He meets the need for spiritual satisfaction for the atonement of our sins. He is the fire of the world. He provides and protects us. He is, uh, he is I am. He is the self-existent a God who always has, has been and always will be. He is the only way to be with the Father. He is the good shepherd. He provides, he meets our need, and we have a sweet relationship with him today because of the blood he offered upon the cross of Calvary. Keeping on long, put forward one chapter to John chapter 11. In John chapter 11, in verse 25. This uh, next one, it describes uh, the, uh, the overall character and the length and the uh, nature of the life that we live, receive at salvation. Jesus said, uh, in verse 25, Lazarus has died. Jesus has come uh, into uh, the region, and he's come up to Bethany. Uh, he, Martha has ran out to me, and she's confronting and said, Well, if you'd have been here sooner, that he, my brother wouldn't have died. And then Jesus says in verse 25, He says, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet he shall live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Believest thou this? She said unto him, 
Yes, Lord. I believe that thou art the Christ, the Son of God, which was to come into the world. Jesus said in verse 25, he said, he is the resurrection. I am the resurrection and the life. Uh, the life that we receive at salvation is eternal life, but it's spiritual life. We are dead to sin, uh, dead because of sin. Uh, when we come to that age, we understand that we are sinners, we die spiritually. But we receive spiritual life when we believe and we trust in Jesus Christ. And even though I might die at that, after that, it will be but physical death. But that physical will rise again. Yet shall he live. Spiritual life, once it has begun, has no end. It's eternal. And Jesus is the resurrection and the life. This physical life may end and it may be over. But one day Jesus will resurrect. There will be a great resurrection day. When our bodies will descend and come up out of those graves. They will be resurrected and changed into glorious, uh, perfect uh, bodies. And no more marred and scarred by sin. But perfect and glorious, just like Christ's body was. Why? Because he is the resurrection and the life. Christ is the first fruits. Uh, he rose from the grave on the third day, and he was but the first fruits of those that are yet to come. They will rise and never to die again. He's the resurrection and the life. If you want true life, you have to know Jesus. If you don't know Jesus, you don't know what life truly is. You may have a physical life, but you have no spiritual. You need to know Jesus. I read verse 27 because I like Martha's statement. He said unto him, Yes, Lord, I believe that thou art the Christ. Uh, this word believe in the Greek is in the perfect tense. It means there is an action completed in the past with ongoing effects and results. Literally, what Martha said is, Lord, I have believed and I still believe. She said, In the past, I believed and I knew that you were the Messiah. I still believe that today. It's ongoing effects. She knew that if Christ wanted to, her brother Lazarus could rise again. He could have Lazarus rise from the grave. He was the one that was supposed to come into the world. I mean, indeed, he had come. Death and sorrow and sadness that are unfortunately a part of the Sidmar world. Uh, but we shouldn't allow that to alter and to change our faith uh, in God. He is the resurrection of life. He has power over death, hell, and the grave. And Martha said, yes, I've lost someone dear to me, but I know that you're the resurrection and the life, and I still have trust. And he, uh, that's where you find the comfort in those times, is only in uh, the Lord. Martha believed, and she still did, even in times of loss. Uh, we don't ever need to lose faith in Christ, even in the hard times. Because that's where we find uh, the comfort and the needs that we are supposed to have. Because Jesus is the resurrection, he is the life. That's all he is. Jesus is the I am, he is the resurrection, and he is uh, the life as well. Uh, I'll just go ahead and uh, remove that. Uh, we'll, we'll kind of quickly run through uh, these two because I want to get to the last one and spend a few minutes on it. Uh, but I quoted this verse uh, a little earlier, uh, but we can turn and read it for very briefly uh, in John chapter 14 uh, and verse 6. Uh, we, we quote this verse quite often, uh, but at times it would do good to simply sit and to think about uh, all this verse actually says. Uh, in John chapter 14 and verse uh, 6, this is uh, Christ's final uh, discussion with his disciples. Uh, this is the final night he's about to be arrested and to be carried away to be hung and die upon the cross. And this is his words of comfort, his words of encouragement to the disciples. Uh, of course, beginning in verse 1, he said, Let not your heart be troubled. Do you believe in God? Believe also in me. In my father's house, many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go and prepare a place for you. That where I and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you into myself. That where I am, there you may be also. Whether I go, you know, and the way you know. Thomas said unto him, Lord, uh, we know not whether thou goest, and how can we know the way? Thomas said, I don't know where you're going, so I could possibly know the way where you're going. Uh, you can't know how to get to where you're going unless you know where you're going in the first place. And Thomas said, I don't know where I'm supposed to be going, and I don't know how I'm going to get there. And Jesus said unto him in verse 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no man comes unto the Father but by me. If you had known me, you would have known my Father also, and from henceforth you know him, and have seen him. 
very simple statement, but with a whole lot of truth in those three little words. He is the way. And the same way that he's the door, and no man comes unto the Father but by him, he's the way. The only path to the Father is by the cross of Jesus Christ. You cannot have a relationship with God unless you know Jehovah Jesus Christ, his son. He is the only way to a relationship with the Father. He is the truth. Uh, he is uh, without error. He is without a fault. He is the truth. Truth, go on to know what truth is, know Jesus, you know truth. And again, he is the life. Uh, that's a recurring theme, it seems like, of these IM statements. He is life. If you want to know what true spiritual life is, you have to know Jesus. Uh, he is the I am that I am. He is Jehovah. He has provided and he has saw and met our need for salvation by the death of his son upon Calvary. He is all we need for salvation. He's the way and the truth and the life. And also, according to chapter 15 and verse 1, he said, I am the true vine. And John 15 and verse 1, uh, he said, I am the true vine, and my father is the husbandman. Uh, every branch of me that bears not fruit, he taketh away, and every branch that bears fruit, he purchases it, that it may bring forth more fruit. And now are you clean through the word which I have spoken uh, unto you. Uh, she has said, I am the true vine. Uh, he, uh, uh, the true vine. Uh, and not the false vine, he's the genuine vine. Uh, a branch on a vine cannot make it unless the main branch, the main stem, is good. If the main part of the plant dies, all the branches off from it will die as well. As Jesus says, I am the true vine. Uh, he was the nourishment. He was what the disciples needed. Uh, God is all sufficient. He meets all of our needs. If you want to bear fruit, and if you want to be uh, effective in the work of the Lord, you have to be in fellowship with the true vine. Uh, if you want to uh, enjoy the sweetness and the joy of a fellowship and of a, the true relationship with God, you have to abide in Him. You have to be studying His Word devoutly and praying and keeping in touch with Him. The thing about a relationship is you got to keep it up. you got to keep in communication and you've got to want to be in touch. And Jesus is that true bond. Uh, he is the one that we must abide with for the bear fruit if we're to be uh, good and to uh, be doing good works here in this life. we got to be in fellowship with the Father. Uh, and there is judgment as well. Uh, those that don't bear fruit, it says, he takes away. Uh, there is judgment. They don't lose their salvation, but they lose their rewards. And they lose, uh, they are judged when they don't obey. Why? Well, as we studied last week, he is children to call. He is the Lord of recompense. He does chasten, he does deal with us as children. Uh, he, sometimes the Father comes through and he has to prove. And boy, sometimes those prune to your hurt a little bit. So it's all a part of making sure they grow is possible. And uh, Jesus is uh, the uh, true vine. He said he was the true vine. He claimed to be God. He claimed to be the sufficient need for the disciples. Jesus is the I am that he, I am. He is all of these things. And if you want to know the Father, you have to know Jesus. Jesus is the way. But the final one I want you to look at. John chapter 18 and verse number Five. This is again just a simple uh, statement uh, of the deity of Christ. But I love the story in this uh, account. In chapter 18, Jesus is praying in the garden, uh, and Judas is leading the soldiers up to to come arrest him. And starting in verse three. It says, Judas then, having received a band of men and officers from the chief priests and Pharisees, came tither with lanterns and torches and weapons. To get one man, they brought legion of Roman soldiers and a bunch of armed priest guards. Okay, they were preparing to fight a war just to arrest one man. Jesus therefore knew all things. Again, note the omnipotent, the all-knowingness of Christ. He knew what they were doing. Doing all things. She come upon him, went forth, and said unto him, Whom seek ye? And he walked up to this group behind the soldiers and said, Who are you seeking? They were seeking him. And they said, uh, They answered, Judas of Nazareth. And Jesus said unto them, 
again, note that he is in italics. So it, literally, he just said, I am. And it says, and Judas also was betrayed and stood with them. And as soon as he said unto them, I am, they went backward and fell to the ground. They said, who, Jesus said, who are you seeking? I said, Jesus of Nazareth. And he said, I am. Every single one of them Jews and Judas himself fell flat on their knees before Christ. Before him. Because they knew what that meant. And I said, well, Jesus said, uh, pausing, he said, who are you seeking? And it says, uh, and they said, Jesus of Nazareth. And he told it. And he answered and said, I have told you that I am he. If, if therefore you seek me, let these go their way. That the same might be fulfilled, you spake of them which thou hast gave me, have I lost none. I love the picture of this statement. I can just see uh, that band of soldiers, all those big uh, guys out there with all their swords and weapons, and this one man says two little words, I am. And they all fall flat on their face before him. Oh, if I could, the the power behind that statement. That was about 300 to 600 men, it said. Yeah. A legion was, yeah. A legion. Tent of a legion. So it's a band, a tent of a legion. Yeah, yeah three to 600 people. Three to 600 yeah. people. Falling, trained for war nonetheless. <laughs> who fell down before a man who simply said two words. I am. Jesus made no... Uh, uh, attempts to hide who he was. He said over and over again in his ministry, I am God. I am the one who has come uh, to be the bread of life. I came down from heaven to uh, be the one who died upon the cross to meet the need you have for salvation. I am the true bread of life. He said, I am the light of the world. I will provide for you. I will protect you all of the way. I will light and I will illuminate your way as you go. Over and over again, he said, I am. He was self-existent. He is before Abraham. And he always will be, indeed. He is the only way to a relationship with the Father. He is the good shepherd. He is one that we have a relationship with by the blood that he shed upon the cross. He is the resurrection and the life. Even though, if you, if you believe and trust in him, even though you might die in this life, you will live again because you have eternal life with the Father. He is the way, the truth, and the life. He is the true vine. He is God. Today, I know we covered a lot of scriptures, but I want you to see and understand that Jesus is Jehovah. He is God. Whatever your needs might be, Jesus can meet them if you let him. He is the all-sufficient one. We all need a Savior. And the Savior God provided was Jesus. And if you'll accept him, he'll never cast you out. And you'll find no need to ever hunger or thirst again spiritually. That's a very good description. Your need is permanently met there. The Jews knew how good that that sounded. They said, oh, give us that bread now. We'll never have to have hunger again. If only they would realize the spiritual application of that. We should learn and yearn to be with that spiritual bread that will permanently meet our spiritual need. But before I start preaching again, uh, understand, Jesus is God. And as you uh, go throughout this week, uh, remember that indeed He is Lord and He is Jehovah. And just think about all those ways that God provides for us and that He meets our needs. Do you all have any, uh, any questions or comments before we dismiss tonight? I don't want to say anything, so you guys believe that really good. What do you do? I appreciate more than ever your sermon, your lesson tonight. I, I think that you're so good, body, and you're everything. I hope you did excellent in every way because you presented the Lord of hosts and the God of our refuge and everything. Jesus Christ. How can people go and say, well, we've got to do this, or we've got to do this, and Jesus didn't, wasn't resurrected bodily, and all kinds of 
ambassador of the state, Miss. You, you put her there in this lesson. There's no way to get around the truth. And I appreciate you, Brother Jen. I'd like to give you a, a Christian hug. Thank you, Brother Indeed, he is. Any, any other questions or comments before we just end? You forgot to ah. Oops. Sorry, people watching. <laughs> <laughs> you forgot to put all the letters up there. Yeah, I was going to do that, but then as I was about, oh, about halfway through that one, I realized that if I did that, it was going to really cut into time. And I wanted to get to the lesson part. It's going to take so, too long to write an ABC or B. I'm just too long winded. Anything else before we dismiss? Hearing none? All right, then we'll go ahead and have a word of prayer. Oh, okay. I forgot something for. Next Thursday, uh, we have a uh, district men's and ladies uh, meeting uh, in Hamilton. And so we won't be able to have class next Thursday night. And so next week, we will have a little break. And then we'll come back the next week, and we will have our final lesson on the names of God and this study. Uh, and then after um, that Thursday night, I will also uh, introduce to you briefly what we will be studying next in the Thursday night classes. Uh, and then, so, uh, just remember, next Thursday, no class. Next Thursday, class. So come for that if you can. And I will do my best to remind you as I am able. Uh, so, we'll go ahead and bow your heads, we'll have a word of prayer, and be dismissed from class. <laughs>